So what we will be looking at, as I said, is uh, some uh, analysis that you can do after cell type in identification. Uh, the possible uh, tools that you could be using is trajectory analysis or ordering of the cells. You could use some meta cell or cell cell communication or go to some more in-depth method like deep neural network. So as of today, the single cell RNA sec tools, it's, uh, there are 166 tools and we will not be looking at all of them. So uh, first, I guess you need to have an understanding about what trajectory analysis is about and when is it, when is it that it is useful. So uh, in terms of um, gene expression and cells, uh, some of the dynamics that you see in your cells could be attributed to, for instance, cell cycle. The dynamics could be also um, be attributed to cell differentiation, like you would have some cells that are in an earlier state and some which are very differentiated, so more some more stem-like. Uh, you could have some that are more responsive or not to an uh, uh, stimuli, so you would like to be able to classify those which do not really respond and those which do respond. And trajectory inference will be able to order the set of uh, cells or the set of uh, clusters along a path or, or sometimes called a trajectory or sometimes called a lineage. So what you are actually doing is create a, an axis of time that you have inferred uh, on your cells, so which is called often pseudo time axis. That's why they also call pseudo time analysis. Uh, and then you can project each of the cells onto that time axis and therefore know which cells are more close to the beginning of your axis and which cells are more close to the end of your axis. This can be a starting point for then further analysis or further differential gene expression analysis uh, to understand which are the genes that are very high at the beginning of the trajectory and which cells are very high at the end. And this can then drive to have you um, um, more hypothesis and a further understanding of the cells and the data sets you have. Yes. So the big question that I would like you to, to ask yourself is, should you run a trajectory analysis? Does it make sense in my data? I always make the analogy of my son who draws now very well, but he could draw a trajectory through your cell. This doesn't mean that this, that, that this is meaningful and that this, hasn't, um, um, that this is really relevant. So be aware that you can always force cells to go along a trajectory. So uh, always uh, be forced to be along a pseudo time axis. But this doesn't mean that this pseudo time axis reveals something biologically meaningful. And so therefore, I would love you to first ask yourself those questions. And if one of those questions you say, definitely, then it might make sense for you to actually look at trajectory analysis. So this is not an extensive list, so there might be also other questions that you might ask, but uh, one of those will be most relevant, I guess, for your setting. So first of all, are you sure that you have a sort of developmental trajectory in your in your cells? So are the, do you have cells that are uh, in a more uh, developed stage or, or more, di more differentiated stage? What you could have also is some intermediate states. And if you have intermediate states, then it makes sense to run the trajectory because then you definitely know that these cells should be somehow in the middle of the trajectory. And this makes you having an opinion about if the trajectory is good for you. Uh, can you believe, do you believe that there is any branching in your trajectory? And this is an important question to understand which trajectory tool you will use. If you have to answer this by yes or by I don't know, you should maybe go to different uh, trajectory tools. Do you have a time scale on your cells? And by time scale, I mean, uh, some people do actually measure cells at different time points. And so they are actually measured, you actually know that they should be part of a trajectory. And then even if you measure them at 24 hours, uh, 48 hours, et cetera, you can still uh, put them along a time scale and you know, uh, if it uh, fits the trajectory that you have inferred on yourself. And the last question, uh, do you have a starting state or an end state? I guess some of you might, uh, might answer that with yes by having some stem cell-like uh, cells. So they, they know these are the, the, the cells that can differentiate into any other cells. So then you have a starting state 
and then it does make sense to do a trajectory analysis or you you know that you have a very end state uh, of your cells so cells that are super differentiated for instance and then you you know that you sh you can or you sh you should try to make a, a trajectory on your on your data be aware as i said that any data set can be forced into a trajectory without having any biological meaning so there may, it might not make any sense to know that B cells in your trajectory come before T cells or come before epithelial cells. Maybe that is not biologically meaningful. But then maybe inside B cells to know which cells are more differentiated than others might make sense. So as you can see in this small example that I tried to make out here, there are some ways to make trajectory analysis meaningful and somewhere it's making it's more uh, difficult to understand the biological meaning behind the trajectory that you have inferred. So to know, there are many different tra trajectory analysis tools and they are working on different maths behind. So some of them will generate graphs that look like that, so cycles. So then for instance, if you have, uh, if you're looking at cell cycle, um, then inferring a trajectory that looks like that where you can come back might actually make sense. You have the, some tools that are linear, so that you only have a starting state and an end state, and that's it. Some have bifurcations, so where at some point you have a cell that can differentiate into several cell types, or multifurcation, or tree-like structure, or connected graph. So you do have some cycles, but you also have uh, other things, and some disconnected graphs. So as you can see here, there are very different um, ways of generating a trajectory. So you already need to be aware of the trajectory tool that you're using in which um, category it lies and then know what is the conclusions that you might, might be able to get. So um, there is an example of application that I would like to go through with you such that you can see actually um, how the trajectory method functions. And here you can see it is uh, from a paper called Single Cell RNA Sec Reveals Dynamic uh, Random Monoallelic Gene Expression in Mammalian Cells. But just for you to know that they have sequenced uh, cells at different sta stages of development. So you either are in um, uh, from oocyte to blastocyte. So um, here, since it's developmental stage, it might really make sense to try to order the cells according to how developed they are. So finding a trajectory here makes biological sense and could be of high interest to try to classify your cells and then to be able to uh, assess which genes are part of that um, trajectory. So just for you to know that actually ordering cells according to PC1, for instance, could already be a trajectory um, analysis method that is linear. You only go from one way to the other, but at least uh, it is actually a trajectory analysis. So here is just for you to see the PCA plot. So as I said, you have from uh, oocyte to, blastoc uh, to blastocyte, and here you can see how the cells are ordered if you order them according to PC1. And so you can see that at the, the early stages of the de development, it still uh, does not fit what you would like. So you would like to have the red cells, which are um, at the very beginning or at the very end of the, the trajectory. And it's not really the case here. Also for uh, the early blast, mid blast and late blast, it's all quite mixed, so it's not, a perfect tool to do trajectory analysis, but this could already have been one. That's why I want you to urge that you, you will be able to infer many trajectories. It doesn't mean that they're biologically making sense. So here then I want to uh, tell you about most many of trajectory tools, how they function, if they are graph based, and then you will then know um, quite a range of trajectory analysis, how they function. So um, what uh, some tools do is that they take a weighted graph and uh, they might be different in the way they generate this weighted graph. Then they take what is called a spanning tree and I explain in a second what it is. And then you will take the minimum of all spanning trees in your cohort. So what's a spanning tree? Here I just have made an example of a weighted graph. So this could be really the case that you have in your data set with cells. 
and the cells could be linked with a certain weight such that you then have um, a knowledge about how close points are. The weight could be, for instance, exactly what we see in an SNN graph. So how many neighbors they share, for instance. This is uh, some tools do rely on KNN or SNN graphs. And what you do with a spanning tree is that you find a way in your graph to link all of your points together through a path. So for instance, uh, I have uh, put in, in dark one possibility, but another possibility would have been to go, um, instead of this link here, you would put this link there. That would be another, another spanning tree. Or for instance, uh, instead of linking that point to the rest of the graph, I link it with here, with that edge. That might be also another spanning tree. So is you just the way to have all the points that are somehow uh, linked to the to the to the core of the graph? As you can uh, understand, um, you will actually look at the sum of all the weights that you have included in your spanning tree, and this will be giving you the weight of the spanning tree that you have generated. And at the end, you will just take the minimum of all of those uh, trees to be able to select a minimum spanning tree. So that's why uh, the minimum spanning tree here in that small example would be the one I put in dark and not the one where I put here this edge instead of this one, because I, if I put this that edge, I add 20, whereas if I put this one, I added only five. And so this is why you would prefer this link than this one to add that point to the, to the spanning tree. So that's the idea of a minimum spanning tree. And as I said, what could be different is the way you generate the graph, the way you generate the weights, and the, the weights can be, uh, for instance, a distance in a dimensionality reduction space, for instance. This is sometimes happening. Um, in a TSNI space, for instance, it happens as well. Uh, and uh, you can also have just correlation between cells. So this would be a correlation score. And you can have, as I said, for instance, the number of uh, shared neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. As you can guess from the way I just said it out loud, since you take the minimum uh, spanning tree, there are actually no cycles. Why? Because if I, for instance, add this here to generate a cycle, this uh, just adds for nothing 20 to my, uh, to my tree, whereas I actually have already this point which is linked to the rest. So you will actually have zero cycles if you go for a method that goes for minimum spanning tree. So if cycles do matter in your analysis, such as if you want to look at cell cycle, for instance, then you should not go for uh, trajectory methods that do rely on minimum spanning tree for their calculation. One such method which is popular is called slingshot. And slingshot, how it functions is that it will generate a graph on your data. The graph is actually based on um, a certain, the, so the weights between the, the points are given by a distances between cluster, where distances between cluster are calculated in that way. So it really resembles a sort of a distance between averages, basically. Um, where xi would be the center of your cluster i and xj would be the center of your cluster j and here you have the variance. So this is really a, a link that would describe how close two clusters are. So as I said it now, uh, it actually generates a, a minimum spanning tree on uh, your, that uh, and each of the points are actually clusters and not cells. So this is how Slingshot works. And once it has generated this minimum spanning tree using that, uh, that weight on the points and the distance, it will actually use um, a, te a technique that was invented a few years ago, which are called principal curves. And principal curves are smooth one-dimensional curves that pass through the middle of a p-dimensional data set, providing a non-linear summary of the data. This means that what it does, it, it is trying to, to, instead of having uh, this line here, to have a smooth line that passes through your, the middle of your data, 
So here, as you can see, it passes straight once you just look at the, the spanning tree because it's a graph. But what you will try to do is that you will try to pass through your data um, uh, going along that line. So what it does is that is taking that line and smoothening it out using the, 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 the theory of principal curves. And you can have a, a look if you if you write question mark slingshot and you add the library slingshot of the reference of principal curves and how they're calculated. But this is how they function. And so at the end, what you can then do is that you project down the, the cells onto your uh, onto your principal curves that you have generated. And then you you will be able to infer where they are on the trajectory. So here, for instance, in that example, they have generated two curves, right? At the beginning, they're sort of together, but they, they divide. So you have a bifurcation here. You could also have a multifurcation in, in, that, uh, in that method. And what's important is that you have some cells that might be part only of one uh, curve and some cells that might be part as those here of both curves. In, in R, it's quite easy. You have the function slingshot, and uh, the function slingshot has, uh, the, uh, uses a single cell experiment object. So you need first to convert your SURAT to single cell experiment object, but as Tanya showed, it's quite uh, easy to do. And then you have to provide the, the labels of the clusters. This is important. As I said, slingshot is based on the assumption of trying to find a minimum spanning tree on your clusters. And so therefore you need to provide those labels and then uh, you need to say on in which uh, reduced dimension you, you would like to work. And this is for uh, being able to know where to generate the principal curves. So this should always correspond probably, um, this should correspond to uh, the, the, the way you generated the clusters. So probably should correspond to PCA. But sometimes if you use um, PCA, then it will generate the principal curves in the PCA reduced space and it will look very weird on the UMAP. So then some uh, authors actually prefer here to use UMAP to generate the principal curves on, on your data set. So this is up to you to, to select. But here in this, in this uh, example, in this paper, they have actually projected the cells onto PC space. They wanted to generate therefore their um, the slingshot on the principal component analysis. So here is how it looks like. You will then have the information about lineages and curves. And here you can see you have two lineages and two curves. Line lineages correspond to what you have here. So when, whenever you have bifurcations and curves correspond to the step here. So for the lineages, you then get the ordering into in one lineage and the order in the second lineage of your cells. And if you do not provide a starting cluster, then uh, it will randomly select if it starts from the end or from the beginning, basically. And so here we did specify the starting cluster. So we said two. So all the lineages will start at two. So as you can see, you have the cluster two first, the cluster four after, zero, five, and three. And the second lineages will have cluster two, four, and as you can see here, it separates, it goes to cluster one. So these are my two, my two lineages, and then you have your two curves. Uh, you have the length of the curves. This length will be the sum of the spanning tree, so all the information you have of distances between your clusters, such that you might know how, how big they are. And here you have an understanding of the samples. So the samples means the number of, of cells that you have on each curve. This looks very weird because it's not an integer number. And this is because some of the cells might be part of several lineages. And here, uh, why is it so blurred? I don't know. Uh, you have the picture of how uh, the slingshot pseudo time of the first uh, lin um, line, so the first curve looks like onto the cells that you have here. So some cells will be only part of the second uh, curve and some parts on some cells only part of the first curve. What you can see is that it orders quite better the early stages that before with, P with trajectory of PC1 was not so good. 
but still the end of the trajectory is not so good in a, uh, to to separate the, the blast st uh, stages. Monoc is another algorithm that is quite popular and that you might uh, be able to practice in the exercises and it's based uh, on an idea that was developed in Python first, which was quite popular at the time before Monocle uh, came in, which was the PAGA algorithm. It's an algorithm in Python and it was used to construct first a k-nearest neighbor graph on the cells then identify communities in that cells and this this generates um this generates uh, communities which they call Louvain communities and then two vertices which are these communities will then be linked with an edge when the cells in the respective com respective communities are neighbors in the k nearest neighborhood graph so this gives you a, a way to also generate um these lineages through communities uh, here it's not working on principal curves, so at the end you have really straight uh, a straight graph that is uh, on your clustering, and this is how Paga works. And Monoclo Tree found this idea quite interesting, but wanted to work on uh, on the cell level, and so they first create the k nearest neighbor on the cell level in the UMAP space. Then they group them together in the Louvain communities, but uh, that's not. Uh, they can also work instead of communities actually work uh, on a higher level on a level of the cell and then they test each pair of communities for a significant number of links between their respective cells and by significant number of links they actually generate something with a p-value where they use a null hypothesis of what they call spurious linkage and this is a, a method that will then tell each of the links how significant the link is and if the link is to be removed or not they uh, uh, and this is how how it works for sure since they test so many uh, links they have to go for uh, multiple testing uh, correction and they therefore they use an fdr and they would use an fdr uh, lower than 0 0.01 to describe if the link should remain or not in the final graph and the final graph is then what is reported So there are quite a lot of additional tools here. I listed some, um, uh, but uh, these are uh, quite some methods that work a little bit differently. Some are working on k-means, some are, are working on dbscan at the beginning for the clustering, and then the link between the cluster are always about proximity in space, and this is how they, they would work. One of the, men, the methods I would like to mention is super time because it's a method that was specifically developed if you have time series data uh, and generates therefore uh, absolute time on time series data. So this is quite interesting. So if you do have in your hand time series data, you should uh, look it up, it's quite nice. And then uh, I would like to mention RNA velocity because it's also a popular tool and it's working so differently that I think it's important to be mentioned. So uh, here I took uh, in the paper what they this how they describe RNA velocity, and they say uh, RNA velocity is a high dimensional vector that predicts the future state of individual cells on a time scale of hours. So they would try for each of the cells to predict where the cells would mostly go to, so to towards which stage they would uh, move to. And that's why it's also a um, trajectory analysis, because it also tries to um, link cells in a certain uh, scale. So it aids the analysis of developmental lineages and cellular dynamics, because it will predict towards which uh, state the cells or which developmental stage the cells are actually going. What it does, and there, uh, there you would actually need the fast two files to understand this, is that it will try to calculate the relative abundance of uh, na nascent, so unspliced, and mature, so the spliced mRNA, to estimate the rates of gene splicing and, and degradation. They are mentioning this fact here, is that during a dynamic process, if you have an increase in the transcription rate, you will have rapid increase in spliced mRNA and increase in spliced uh, mRNA uh, until a new steady state is reached. So 
Therefore, if you would like to, if you would do the ratio of unspliced and spliced, you would have a uh, uh, knowledge about if you have increase in transcription rate or decrease. And a drop in the rate of transcription is then a drop in unspliced mRNA and reduction in spliced mRNAs. This is how it works. During induction of gene expression, you will have unspliced mRNA that are, pre that are present in excess. And during repression, you will have unspliced mRNA that are present in lower amounts. And therefore, you can um, have an understanding about which state you are in and what's the, the next. So the balance of unspliced and spliced mRNA abundance is therefore an indicator of the future state of your, um, your mRNA. And then it gives you the future state also of the cell. And that's their, their general idea of the algorithm and how it should work. Um, I think, Tanya, you, you used it uh, on a data set. I don't have that exper experience yes. to, to comment of yes. how good it was and how useful you, you could have it. Well, I used it on one data set, but I think they didn't uh, include it in the publication because it wasn't so convincing. Um, and then another colleague of us uh, tried to rerun it, changing the parameters, and it gave totally different results. So we're, in, I think, in the group, we're not super uh, convinced about RNA velocity, but I guess it all depends on your data set. So personally, yes. running it is not difficult, but well, it's, it's, it's intensive. Yeah, it's competitive. It needs to be mentioned. Yes. Exactly. But then, yeah, yes. so more or less convincing. OK, perfect. So then the, the last um, part of what I want to show you is how you could do cell-cell communication. And I did not put here the single cell, I think, or any tools, yes. But uh, there are also quite some cell-cell communication tools that would exist. I mentioned some of them here because I have a, a little bit of sense of what they did because I did try them. Uh, but there might be some others that exist and that maybe you at the end would like to add, Gert um, or Tanya. So there is the ligand receptor interaction potential, which is a number that if it is bigger than one, it, you have a high interaction potential. And this is, uh, you would calculate it only with one cell against all the other cell types, such that then you know how um, interesting uh, is the, um, the communication between one cell type and the others. How it's working is just by looking at the number of um, pairs of ligand and receptors that you would have expressed in, in your cell type and in the other cell type. Uh, and with that, it will understand the, the potential of in, uh, interaction. It will then also generate um, randomly mixing it all up and then understanding how many times you actually got the same result and so how significant the result is or if the result can also be obtained by chance. And this is how you then will be able to get the confidence interval and then understand which are the, the um, communication that are significant. So this is how uh, ligand receptor interaction potential would work. <clears throat> um, cell phone DB is also to be mentioned. There is a clickable uh, version. There it's also working with uh, receptors and ligands being expressed. So it's only looking at the expression and it is uh, therefore trying to infer communication li like that. NicheNet, I will just discuss it afterwards and because it's quite different. And cell chat is also, you do also have an online version and you do have an R version and it does uh, output um, graphs that are quite nice to look at and nice to understand. It's also working only on pairs, ligand and receptors. So you, you would uh, be able to, to put, uh, you, you should look it up because it might be relevant for your work because it's visually appealing. So then NicheNet is working quite differently. So I would like to, to mention how it works. Uh, you need to have some prior, prior knowledge and we will explain how. And the idea of NicheNet is the following. 
in your analysis, you have a certain list of differentially expressed genes in a certain cell type. So you have two conditions. You had healthy cells and you had uh, cells with a certain disease. And inside your, I don't know, B cells, you assess genes that are um, significantly different between your two conditions. And you would like to understand, can you associate that pair, uh, a pair of ligand and receptor that might be responsible for the change that you observed in, in the, that list of significant genes? So can you try to understand what's causing the genes to be so different uh, between two conditions? And so this is actually quite useful because then it might point biologists to possible pathways that they need to target or po possible um, uh, communication or cell, communi cell, cell communication that they might want to look at in order to stop whatever they see um, as a process. So how it works is that they have a, a prior knowledge and so they have a table of ligands and targets uh, that they, they know uh, are being able to be regulated by those ligands. So they have a certain list of targets and for all the ligands that they have included in their data set, they would assess a potential of regulation. And so I put in dark red the, 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 the higher potential for this illustration. So, and in, in yellow, you would have less potential of regulation. So this ligand number one would be able to very much influence the gene expression of that gene number N and the ligand number M is very likely to change the expression of gene number one. So this is their table of prior knowledge. And you have your list of differentially expressed genes. And what you would do is that you will change that into a vector of zeros and ones. And so then you know uh, which are the target genes that are differentially expressed in your, in your setting. So for instance, this the gene number one was differentially expressed, the gene number two as well, all the others were not, and the gene number N was as well differentially expressed. What you then do is that you just generate a correlation between your vector and the prior knowledge that you have. And with that, it should enable you to uh, point you towards ligands that might be interesting to look at because they uh, are uh, regulating the same target genes that are among your differentially expressed uh, list. So here in this setting, probably that ligand and that ligand might correlate um, with the the path, uh, with the gene expression, the differential gene expression that you have here. And so at the end, what you do get is that you get a score, you get a Pearson correlation and a spearman rank correlation of your ligands such that you know which ligands are more likely to be uh, regulating the list of differentially expressed genes that you have. And with that, you can then try to look at the ligands that are potential candidates for regulating your, uh, dysregulating your list of genes. And then you can have a look at where they are actually highly expressed. And so therefore make the assumption that here that gene is highly expressed in fibroblast and in this lymphocyte. So maybe these two cell types uh, are possibly um, communicating with another cell type to dysregulate the, the genes as you have. You do the same, you have then a, a list of ligands and their receptor. And so, so this is also provided by uh, Nishnet. So you then know, um, which uh, are the possible uh, re receptor for the ligands that you have found being probably responsible for your changes. And you can then have do the same thing. So checking where these receptors are located, uh, for instance, with the dot plot, and then you can again make the assumption that they might be communicating to that pair of ligand receptor to dysregulate the changes you see. Yes. So at the, at the end, uh, they have a list of ligands and receptors that uh, they uh, have narrowed down to a shorter list of ligands and receptors. And this shorter list of ligands and receptors that have been manually curated, they, uh, uh, they do say that you can trust this a little bit more. So this is, about, but how, however, it's a smaller list. So you could also use that uh, pair of ligand receptor to try to infer 
the cell cell communication. So here really NicheNet is a little bit different because it's it's not only enabling you to look at pairs of ligand and receptor, but associate that pair of ligand and receptor with changes observed. And therefore it might be uh, quite relevant to try to um, to make some assumption, some some hypothesis that need to be tested, but of some communication that might happen in your in your in your setting or in your dysregulated setting. So in your comparison that you that, that you did. So I think that's the last slide. Yes.